Good morning. The time is now 9.30 a.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of August 9, 2022 is called to order. The first item on the agenda is the approval of agenda and order of priority. Are there any items board members would like to add or delete from the agenda? Hearing none, may I please have a motion to approve the agenda and order of priority? So moved. Moved by uh, Board President Albridge, seconded by Dr. Pritchett. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, uh, Marilyn, a roll call vote. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pew? She's on her way. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albridge? Yes. Motion carries. Many of you are aware that Mr. Jason Strayhorn resigned from the State Board of Education on July 29, 2022. We thank Mr. Strayhorn for his public service, and we wish uh, him and the Strayhorn family all the very best. At this time, Marilyn Schneider, our State Board Executive, will introduce the members of the State Board of Education. Good morning. As, as uh, we go around the table um, and to other parts of the room, I will introduce to Dr. Rice's left, Dr. Cassandra Albrich. She's the president of the board, and she's from Dearborn. Dr. Pamela Pugh, you just heard me say, um, is on her way. She's the board's vice president, and she's from Saginaw. She'll be seated next to Dr. Albrich. Ms. Tiffany Tilly is the board's secretary. She's from West Bloomfield, and you see her up here. And Ms. Ellen Lipton is chair of the board's legislative committee. She's from Huntington Woods. She is also at the raised counter. Um, Ms. Nikki Snyder, coming back down to the table, is State Board of Education Legislative Committee member. She's from Dexter. Next to her is the Teacher of the Year who has been joining us for the past year, Ms. Leah Porter. She's a third grade teacher at Wilcox Elementary School in Holt Public Schools. As we go across the table, Stephanie O'Day is the governor's K-12 policy advisor. She's an ex officio non-voting member representing the governor. She will be joining the meeting today virtually. And back at the table, Judy Pritchett, Dr. Judith Pritchett, NASB delegate and State Board of Education Legislative Committee member from Washington Township. That's the board's association, NASB, National Association of State Boards of Education. Next to me is Mr. Tom McMillan, the board's treasurer from Oakland Township. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. There are two resolutions that require approval before we move to the presentations. There's a resolution honoring the 2021-2022 Michigan Teacher of the Year, Ms. Leah Porter, and a resolution honoring the 2022-2023 Michigan Teacher of the Year, Ms. Nanette Hansen. May I please have a motion to approve the resolutions? So moved. Moved by our president. Uh, do I have a second? Second from Ms. Tilly, uh, closely followed by Ms. Lipton. Any discussion? Hearing none, if we could do a roll call vote. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh absent. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Motion carries. On May 4th, during a school visit to the Upper Peninsula in uh, Michigan, I made a surprise announcement naming Ms. Nanette Hansen as the 2022-2023 Michigan Teacher of the Year. I'm not so sure. Uh, how big a surprise it was. It's hard to keep a surprise from, um, uh, from anyone for too long in Escanaba. <laughs> Ms. Ned Hansen is a first grade teacher at Lemmer Elementary in Escanaba Area Public Schools who is beginning her 26th year of teaching this fall. She was selected for more than 275 nominees statewide. Ms. Tiffany Tilly represented the State Board of Education as a member of the interview panel and we thank her. This presentation will be facilitated by Dr. Delsa Chapman, Deputy Superintendent, Division of Educator, Student and School Supports, and Ms. Jennifer Robel, Manager of Recruitment and Recognition Unit in the Office of Educator Excellence. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ms. Tilly, too. You were an integral part of the interview panel, and I appreciate your time. Thanks. So the Michigan Teacher of the Year, organized by the MDE, Office of Educator Excellence, and sponsored by the Mimic Education Foundation, identifies exceptional teachers in our state, recognizes their effective work in the classroom, 
amplifies their voices and empowers them to participate in policy discussions at the state level. Teachers are recognized both regionally and at a statewide level. Regional Teachers of the Year and the Michigan Teacher of the Year comprise the Michigan Teacher Leadership Advisory Council and serve as an invaluable resource to the Michigan Department of Education and other state education stakeholders by representing the views of teachers in important policy discussions. In addition to serving as the head of the Michigan Teacher Leadership Advisory Council, the Michigan Teacher of the Year represents Michigan teachers at national events organized by the Council of Chief, Chief State School Officers, and the Michigan Teacher of the Year is Michigan's candidate for the National Teacher of the Year. The R Toys and M Toy were selected following a multi-level process that began with more than 320 total nominations. They were nominated by students, staff, and community members. And now we get to watch the video of Miss Hansen, which I don't think it was a surprise because I came around the corner, she saw me and <laughs> game over, but um, <laughs> of when she was made mission teacher of the year. And so one teacher of 100,000 teachers in the entire state of Michigan gets named the Michigan Teacher of the Year. Can we have a drum roll? <laughs> every day and it's how many people have had Mrs. Hansen as a teacher? How many people think we have a bunch of fun in first grade? And we're so ladies and gentlemen and members of the board and Dr. Rice, I'd like to introduce you to the 22-23 Teacher of the Year, Miss Nanette Hansen. give her PowerPoint presentation um, right now, and then we'll introduce the um, nine other regional teachers of the year. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm a little bit, bit emotional and, and very nervous, so Thank please bear with me. Uh, Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here uh, working with the State Board of Education and all of you over the next year. Again, I'm Nanette Hansen, and I, I'd like to take a, a, a few minutes to share a little bit about myself and my passions about education. I live in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan in Gladstone. I'm married to my husband, Tom, for 22 years, and I have two kids, Lucas, who's 19, and McKenna, who is 21, and they're both going downstate this year to go to college, so we're going to be empty nesters. Um, we're kind of excited about that. Um, I enjoy traveling, walking, biking, reading, and spending time with my family and friends, and I currently teach first grade in the Escanaba Public Schools. <clears throat> I had many great educators in elementary school and in high school growing up. They taught me the importance of relationships and that is the most important thing and the key to education is creating those meaningful relationships. The teachers that I'm speaking about are the real reason why I became a teacher. They went above and beyond to, forget, to forge a positive relationship with me. They helped me to see something in myself that I could not yet see. 
And I knew that I wanted to be that person for other kids. I always knew I wanted to be a teacher and make a difference. I went to school at Northern Michigan University where I received my bachelor's degree and my master's as well. I have taught a variety of age groups from alternative high school all the way down to first grade where I've been teaching in Escanaba schools for the last 16 years. This will be my 17th year. Um, each of these experiences were rewarding in their own way. However, teaching first grade is pretty magical. I get the opportunity to establish meaningful relationships and ignite a child's love of learning, which is the most important goal for me. And I know that the importance it carries for a child's continued success and happiness going forward in their school careers. <laughs> my reason for teaching. Over the years, I've learned alongside my kids and I have been shown how to fully listen, love, and grow as an empathetic human being just by watching their examples. I fully realized through the years that you don't just need classroom management, but you need to establish those strong, loving, caring, and meaningful relationships that allow students to become passionate, independent learners and thinkers who can drive their own learning and use their own personal strengths to learn and grow each day. Those meaningful relationships also apply to students' families and caregivers, because making sure that they know you care about their child every day and that you're willing to help and support them in any way that you can establishes a partnership that is beneficial for everyone. Additionally, I believe in developing a positive school culture where students see and hear positive adults who are committed to giving them and their families the best possible educational opportunities and experiences. I believe that sharing my passion with training and new teachers is really important to elevating this very important profession. I mentor two first grade teachers in my school, and I also work as a first grade team leader. I sit on our Leader in Me Lighthouse team, leadership team, and I work together with our Title I teacher and staff to provide family involvement opportunities throughout the school year to our Lemmer families. Leader in Me provides leadership lessons to our K-3 students that provides them with supports, social and emotional tools that help our students successfully understand their complex feelings and helps them to navigate through those. This year, sorry, this year, I want my focus to be clearly on how we look at equity for all students. I want to talk about recruiting and retaining diverse passionate teachers, and I also want to talk about the importance of safety for our students and our staff when they go to school each day. And lastly, I think that we need to further develop and support the mental health of both our students and our staff by providing more supports for their mental health, both in school and in the community at large. And because I'm a first grade teacher, <laughs> I just wanted to share a, just a bit of inspiration from this book, The World Needs More Purple Schools by Kristen Bell and Benjamin Hart. Just be you. The one and only you in the entire universe. That's right. When the one and only curious and kind you adds your story and your ideas and your smarts to your school, it helps us all learn more things about the world we live in and the people we live here with. And that helps our world get bigger and our world get better. And that's why we need more purple schools. So let's make a bigger and better world for our students and our teachers and our families everywhere. I'm excited to have this opportunity to learn more about the important work that needs to be done and make our world a bigger and better place to learn and grow. And I'm ready to get started doing this important work. Thank you. Okay, now on to the more fun part, funner, funner, okay.
So, Dr. Rice, are you ready to hand off the plaques? Yeah. Okay. First, we have Kathy Lambries, an English social studies and reading teacher at Roscommon Middle School in Roscommon Area Public School Dis District. Today, she has Ted Hansen, or I'm sorry, Principal Michelle Maloney, Roscommon Middle School, and Casey Hook, uh, last year's teacher of the year, with her. Region 3, Bill Borman, a STEM teacher at, okay, for, he was named Regional Teacher of the Year at Holland Middle School, but um, he's moving districts. He will be teaching fourth grade at um, the Gifted and Talented Program at Woodbridge Elementary School and Zeeland Public Schools. Oh. And with him, we have Superintendent Brandy Lynn Mendham and Principal Chris Mack, and his wife Liz, who is also um, at that same school that Bill will be teaching at. Mm -hmm. Region four is Don Perez, she is a business technology teacher at Swan Valley High School in Swan Valley School District. And with her today is Principal Marcus Munich, colleague uh, Christine Palmer, Vanessa Benkert, and her daughter, or her daughter, and Frederick Wood, her father. Region 5 is Karen Slino, a math, teacher at, a math teacher at Flushing Senior High School and Flushing Community Schools. And with her is Superintendent Matt Shanafelt, Principal Jason Melinchek, and um, her husband, or her brother Bill, her friend Kelly. Right, right. Okay. Right. <laughs> he doesn't bite. You can come over here. <laughs> <laughs> Region 6 is Ashley Lohr. She is a music teacher at Grand Ledge Public School. And with her today is the Director of Communications, John Ellsworth, and her mother, Pat. Region 7 is Dustin Sayers. He's a social studies teacher at Schoolcraft Junior Senior High School and Schoolcraft Community Schools. With him is Superintendent Rick Friends and his wife, Sarah, and his beautiful son, Alexander. Come on, Alexander. Oh, <laughs> 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 
Region 8 is Stacy Trozen. She's a science teacher at Pickney Community High School and Pickney Community Schools. And with her is Superintendent Rick Todd, Principal Julia McBride, um, Ron Tro Trozen, her husband, and Abigail, her daughter. Region 9 is Jennifer Sepetis, a social studies teacher at West Bloomfield High School in West Bloomfield School District. And with her is Superintendent Dr. Bazzi, Principal Eric Pace, and her husband, John. In Region 10 is Carl Brownlee. He's a social studies teacher at Fisher Magnet Upper Academy in Detroit Public Schools Community District. And with him is Principal Michael Johnson and his wife, Vera. Before I introduce uh, Nana, I just want to thank Pam Harlan of the Mimic Foundation. She is our um, sponsor for this program, and without them, um, we wouldn't be able to do this. So if you see her, please say thank you to her. Okay, Region 1 Regional Teacher of the Year and the new Michigan Teacher of the Year is Nanette Han Hansen. She's a first grade teacher at Lemmer Elementary School in Escanaba Public Schools, and her husband, Tom, and Superintendent Dr. Kobe Fletcher are here with her today. Um, so now, David, are you, okay, if we could have uh, Ms. Porter come up and be presented with her um, resolution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Porter, Leah Porter has created the standard for what a teacher of the year should be. Yeah. She's yeah. an outstanding yes, she has. Yes, she has. Leah, can we get another picture? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 And that's right. Okay. Leah, can we get a picture? Absolutely. Yes. Let's just go after this. Thank you. 
um, board members, I'd like to thank former staff members. Sorry. been our few months. Josh Wiesner, who built this program up from the ground. Georgia Beard. Uh, Marty Snitchin, who's still here. Thank God. And of course, Shelby behind me. Without her, this wouldn't happen. So thank you very much. It's thank been you. a pleasure serving you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Give, um, we could give our guests a little bit of time to, um, to exit before we begin our next um, before we begin our next presentation. Is it going to be downstairs? Or I don't upstairs? know. They should do it here. Do you want to be in it, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Then if they're going to do it upstairs, that'd be great. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, yes. It's two sided. Take it. Okay. Yeah, just slide it out and take this up. I'm going to make sure. Yep. I'll lay her. Please. Yeah. Thank you for everything this year, Nikki. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being such a kind support to me at this board mm -hmm. table. Oh, you're so welcome. Nice. Appreciate it. Can we get ready? <laughs> yeah. those letters okay. tomorrow. We're approving them by my whole staff. We have a retreat. So I'll okay. give you a third. Okay. That'd be great. you advance the slides or do mm -hmm. you okay. have Corinne, Sue's in control. Oh. Always. Uh, uh, <laughs> she's got it. Control <laughs> freak. I need <laughs> therapy. Dr. Rice, I'm sorry to interrupt. Teaching the year right here, right here. Okay. All right. <laughs> Very sorry good. Sorry for the Exciting time. 
<laughs> it really is. Before we do our next presentation, Dr. Delsa Chapman, Deputy Superintendent of Educator, Student, and School Supports, would like to make a brief introduction. Dr. Chapman. Thank you, Dr. Rice, and good morning, Board of Education. It gives me honor and pleasure today to introduce my new special assistant, Ms. Anne Marie Mace. She's been with us for almost a month, but over the last three weeks, she has already shown that she definitely is a superhero. We welcome you to the division, and we know that there are great things ahead. Welcome, Ms. Anne Marie Mace. Thank you so much. Welcome, Anne Marie. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Next item on the Committee of the Whole agenda is presentation on accountability and supports. This presentation includes information about the federal and state accountability systems, identification of schools in need of support to improve learner outcomes, and the ways in which the Michigan Department of Education will differentiate support for districts and schools that will be identified as comprehensive support and improvement, additional targeted support, and targeted support and improvement in the fall of 2022. We welcome our presenters, Dr. Sue Carnell, Chief Deputy Superintendent, Dr. Delsa Chapman, Deputy Superintendent for the Division of Educator, Student, and School Supports, Dr. William Bill Pearson, Director of the Office of Partnership Districts, Dr. Corinne Edwards, Director of the Office of Educational Supports, and Mr. Andy Middlestead, Director of the Office of Educational Assessment and Accountability. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. There will, however, be a brief test at the end of the presentation. <laughs> Presenters, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good day, Dr. Rice, and good day, members of the State Board of Education. Thank you for this opportunity to present to you information on accountability, accountability and support. By way of reminder, in June of this year, Dr. Pearson and I presented information on supports to districts with schools in need of comprehensive support and improvement, otherwise known as CSI schools. Dr. Pearson at the time provided an overview of the partnership model, some of the past supports to partnership districts through partnership agreements, and highlighted research on the positive efforts related to the partnership model. Today, you will hear about the accountability, accountability process and the proposed supports to the department that the department plans to provide to schools identified in need of either comprehensive support and improvement, additional targeted support, or targeted support and improvement. You may hear CSI, ATS, and TSI. In addition to the team that is with me today, I also want to recognize other contributors to this presentation. Michael Powell, Assistant Director of the Office of Educational Support. Chris Janzer, Assistant Director, Office of Assessment and Accountability. Liz Newell, Assistant Administrator, Office of Strategic Planning and Implementation and Chad Bailey, Accountability Specialist, Office of Assessment and Accountability. And now I will turn it over to Andy Middlestead. Good morning, board. I'm happy to start our presentation with you today with the, the first few slides to lay out briefly a little bit about the accountability and how it plays into our presentation today. So the Every Student Succeeds Act uh, is the federal reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act ESEA. ESSA, which again is the Every Student Succeed Act, is the nation's education law 
and it represents a long-standing commitment to equal opportunity for all students. ESSA requires that each state establish a statewide accountability system for public schools in the state. Michigan's federal index system is our system to comply with these requirements of ESSA. We call it the school index system. The index system is a 0 to 100 measure that represents the percent of the targets met. The school index, let's go back one, the school index is used to identify schools for support to improve student academic achievement, which we'll be discussing more today. Next slide, please. <coughs> the index system identifies into three specific categories and that we're going to spend the rest of this presentation talking about in detail on how we can support these categories. Next slide. Now, Michigan also has an accountability system defined by state law. This is often referred to as the A to F system. The state system also identifies schools for CSI, but the state law defines CSI differently than ESSA does. Law provides no support funding for schools identified by the state system. The state CSI designation will not be used in determining which districts will receive support described later in this presentation. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bill Pearson, and I will share information regarding how the Office of Partnership Districts will provide support to schools identified for comprehensive support and improvement. Partnership districts supported by the Office of Partnership Districts are districts having schools in the bottom 5% of the Michigan School Index and schools with a four-year graduation rate of 67% or below. Districts in a partnership agreement may also have schools identified for CSI that do not meet partnership agreement entrance criteria. For example, alternative education schools, and or schools identified for ATS or TSI. The Office of Partnership Districts will support any schools within the district that have been identified for support. This flow chart explains which districts will receive a partnership agreement. We start with the question, does the district have any schools identified for CSI then we go to the gray box and subtract schools that meet the following conditions. Alternative education high schools identified as CSI, schools identified as CSI due to unimproved proficiency, and schools identified for CSI due to not exiting ATS status. All districts with an adjusted CSI count of one or more will have a partnership agreement. Newly identified partnership districts will be assigned to a level of support according to why the district was identified. The levels are intensive, essential, and fundamental. Thank you. A partnership district identified for intensive level support is a district that previously had a partnership agreement and has one or more schools re-identified for comprehensive support and improvement. The expectations of partnership districts with intensive supports are two on-site meetings per month. Director or assistant director of OPD participates in writing partnership agreements and develop a line measurable 18-month interim target benchmarks and 36-month end target outcomes that will be achieved for each school operated by the district that is subject to a partnership agreement. Additionally, the Office of Partnership Districts, Intermediate School Districts, and Districts develop the partnership agreements based on a comprehensive needs assessment utilizing the Michigan Integrated Continuous Improvement Process, or MICIP, and conduct semi-annual presentations on partnership agreement progress at local board meetings. The Michigan Integrated Continuous Improvement Process is utilized for all districts identified for support. MICIP is a pathway for districts to improve student outcomes by assessing whole child needs to develop plans and coordinate funds. 
A partnership district identified for essential level support is a district with a previous partnership agreement that only has a single school newly identified for CSI in the bottom 5% of the school index, or a district without a previous partnership agreement in which a school is identified for CSI in the bottom 5% by the school index. The expectations of partnership districts with essential supports are on-site monthly meetings between liaison and district, utilizing MICIP, and developing benchmarks and outcomes. Additionally, a meeting with the liaison district leadership and ISD personnel is held every other month. The director or assistant director of OPD conducts quarterly school visits. <coughs> the OPD director approves the district's partnership agreement and an annual presentation on partnership agreement progress is conducted at a local school board meeting. <clears throat> a partnership district identified for fundamental level support is a district identified due to low graduation rate. The expectations of districts receiving fundamental supports include on-site every other month meetings between liaison and district leadership, utilizing MICIP, and developing benchmarks and outcomes. Additionally, the OPD director approves the district partnership agreement. At a minimum, quarterly meetings are held on site with the liaison, district leadership, and ISD personnel, and the director or assistant director of OPD conducts twice a year school visits. Now I'll turn our presentation over to Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Dr. Pearson, and good morning to the State Board and everyone joining us this morning. Corinne Edwards and I will be sharing information regarding supports provided by the Office of Educational Supports. Districts supported by the Office of Educational Supports, or OES, may have schools identified for CSI that are alternative ed schools meeting one or more of the following criteria. They're in the bottom 5%, have a four-year graduation rate of 67% or less, or were previously identified for CSI and did not exit due to unimproved proficiency and or were previously identified for ATS and did not exit ATS, which then converts to comprehensive <coughs> supports and non-alternative ed schools that were either previously identified for CSI and did not exit CSI due, due to unimproved proficiency but are no longer in the bottom 5% or were previously identified for ATS and did not exit ATS, thus converting to CSI. This flow chart shows the process just discussed for determining schools with, de determining districts with schools that will receive CSI supports, which will be provided by the Office of Educational Supports. The Office of Educational Supports will use a coordinated cross-unit team approach to provide CSI guidance and support services to districts with identified schools as outlined under the Every Student Succeeds Act or ESSA. OES coordinated, CSI coordinated support services to districts with identified schools will include regular meetings with district and school leaders to establish rapport and develop a collaborative approach to address the reason for CSI support identification, coordinated services between local ISDs, recess, and other MDE offices to customize and tailor wraparound services to address the needs of districts with identified schools, guidance with the revision of each school's annual improvement plan to include CSI-specific ESSA-required items, including evidence-based <coughs> interventions to address the specific area or areas of need as identified in each school's comprehensive needs assessment, as well as the identification, preparation, and making accessible to districts <coughs> a suite of survey tools and resources to address operational, fiscal, and systemic barriers to improvement technical assistance and professional development as requested in the areas I've identified need, including the resource allocation review and conducting an annual review and approval of school level plans, 
providing guidance as needed for necessary revisions based upon progress monitoring of established improvement goals. OES staff will leverage the MICIP or the Michigan Continuous Improvement Process to review and, if necessary, revise the current school improvement plan for schools identified for CSI supports to complete a comprehensive needs assessment, to conduct a root cause analysis to identify underlying causes of the problem, to review available funding to identify resources for implementation of school level plans, to ensure each school's improvement plan addresses identified root causes or cause, and evidence and include evidence and research-based strategies, to document alignment of the school level CSI plan with the district improvement plan, noting systems level support in the work, and to monitor implementation of school level plans. An OES Coordinated Supports Point of Contact, or CSPC, will be assigned to work with each district with identified schools. The CSPC will coordinate services between OES units, other MDE offices, and local ISDs and RESAs to customize services to address the specific needs of districts with identified schools. Regional and other OES consultants will serve as the CSPCs to support districts and schools. The current OES structure of five statewide regional support areas will serve as the foundation for CSPC coordinated support assignments. In the first year of OES providing CSI coordinated support services to districts and schools, the initial planning phase will include assignment again of a CSPC for districts with schools identified for supports, initial consultation with district and school leaders, establishing a regular schedule for meeting and support service sessions with identified schools, providing guided support as requested by districts as they complete the resource allocation review as required under ESSA, as well as guiding the revision of the school's improvement plan to align with ESSA required CSI components and include evidence-based interventions to address the specific root cause for identification and coordinating the process for review and SEA approval of the school level plan. <clears throat> OES coordinated supports and services in years two and three will include, excuse me, will continue with a CSPC for each district with identified schools and will include initiating the CSI monitoring process, coordinating technical assistance with partners and content area specialists, and monitoring the implementation and evaluation of the approved district and school plans. The Office of Educational Supports, or OES, will also provide coordinated supports and services to districts with schools identified for additional targeted supports, or ATS. Districts supported by the Office of Educational Supports may have schools identified for ATS supports, and those schools <coughs> identified for ATS supports have both one or more student subgroups consistently underperforming across components and one or more student subgroups in the bottom 5% overall. Districts with schools identified for ATS supports and are not in a partnership agreement will be supported by the Office of Educational Supports, or OES, as requested by the district using the same protocols and services as outlined for schools identified for CSI and supported by OES. Districts with schools identified for ATS and are in a partnership agreement will be supported by the Office of Partnership Districts as part of their district partnership agreement. This flow chart shows the process just discussed for determining districts with schools that will receive ATS supports, which will be provided by the Office of Educational Supports. And then finally, the provision of coordinated supports and services for districts with schools identified for targeted support and improvement, or TSI, will be via an MDE universal approach. Districts with schools identified only for TSI will be primarily supported through universal supports provided by, MTE, by MDE 
to all districts, plus specific communications regarding TSI, such as resources explaining the TSI identification and guidance regarding the TSI plan requirement. Again, this flowchart displays the process for determining districts with schools that will receive TSI universal supports from MDE. Thank you this morning for the opportunity to present this information, and I will now turn it over to Dr. Carnell and Dr. Rice. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Uh, thank you, Dr. Edwards, Dr. Pearson, Andy Middleton. Back to you, Dr. Rice. Thank you very much, presenters. Uh, board members, questions, comments? Mr. McMillan. Um, so how, how uh, long has this been going on? Is it over 36 months now? Could you be a little bit more specific? No, we have partnership it? district. Ha have we had any that have gone in and come out of partnership district? We, we started with, in 2017, 35 districts or 36. We now have 26 districts. Okay. And so we've had, um, I think, nine districts that have uh, ended the partnership agreement or closed the CSI school, so therefore the agreement was terminated. Okay. So and a, a district could be in the partnership because of one school. Yes. Right? And so sometimes the school might be closed or adjusted some way, but have there been schools that have actually gotten out? You know, I mean, they didn't close. They, they followed through and... Uh, there were two districts that were in round one that had agreement uh, for three years and then because they were successful in their RGA, the review of goal attainment, as COVID hit, we let those two districts out of the agreement because they were um, doing very well and they were meeting their goals that they had established. Okay. So I wonder if we could... Um I mean, I, I think it might be helpful to go to go to those schools uh, personally. I mean, we'd, we'd be allowed to, right, a, a board members. I mean, I, I thought maybe bringing them here and kind of hearing how it all went, um, but it might be better just to go there. Is that something you can just give us the names of those two schools and uh, potentially we could go visit if we wanted we, to? We can, have, we can have more conversation about that. I think the, the other thing to realize is, is that I think, Mr. McMillan, to, to the, in, the initial thrust of your question, the, the process um, that was reflected upon in 2017 was a little bit uh, interrupted by the pandemic. You may recall that in 2020, we didn't have state summit of assessments. Mm -hmm. And so there was no opportunity to um, rename or, for that matter, um, in many cases, release districts from partnership status. In 2021, we had state summative assessments, but every district didn't participate in the same way. You may recall that there were parents whose uh, children weren't coming to school, and so they didn't test in 2021. And we felt, for obvious reasons, that it didn't make sense to assign high-stakes consequences to schools in this um, environment. I might add the federal the U.S. Department of Education <clears throat> determined the same thing. They gave us waivers on high-stakes accountability requirements, both in the spring of 20, spring of 21. <clears throat> so this process, which began in 17, and which would have had a, a different answer in the absence of a pandemic, has a has a so, sort of an odd footnoted answer given given the pandemic and given the the 2020 absence of state testing the 2021 um, less than full state testing. Uh, I think I, I understand yeah. that, but I mean, you know, it, it's no secret that most, if not all of us around the table are not too excited about high stakes testing <laughs> and about the focus on testing. So including quite frankly, the state superintendent, right? But, including the state right, superintendent. Right. So yeah. quite frankly, you know, I would hope that we see a lot of, and I'm not looking, this is not a gotcha. I support I know this that. whole thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I mean, understood. this is what, I think one of the most important things we could be doing here is helping schools that are, you know, having difficulties. And we saw some of those schools, uh, you know, President uh, Elbridge and I, mm -hmm. we went and visited some of the ones that Snyder's person wanted to shut down back in uh, 17 and stuff like that. So we've seen some of these and I'm hoping that you don't need a test to know that things got better. I don't, I don't need to know that. I hope that the parents don't need to know that. And I hope the 
teachers don't. I mean, half of them just needed, you know, I mean, it would be helpful if they had roofs that didn't leak and teachers that weren't temporary and, you know, that, that hung around. And I mean, I don't know, are those the type of things that's, that happened or are we just going to worry about tests? You know, I mean, I guess I'd like to hear, I would expect to be able to hear, you know, things that happened other than we learned better on taking tests, you know? So can can we really go back to the June presentation and reshare with the board um, the goals? So when we talk about review of goal attainment, we're not simply talking about product goals and we're not simply talking about state summit of assessment goals. We're also talking about process goals. And it might be helpful to remind the board that it was a mix of process attainment and product attainment that, that, that helps one exit. Yes, and we had, every district had several process goals. And process goals are goals that revolve around reducing chronic absenteeism, uh, reducing school suspensions, um, putting together a strategic plan, um, you know, having teachers get together and coordinate what they're doing at each grade level and, and having conversations. So we conducted reviews of those process benchmarks and goals. And that had a lot to do with creating a better system within the district to get more organized mm -hmm. and to then offer a better uh, education for the students. And then there are the local assessments that were utilized also. So it's not just the state scores. It's not just uh, MSTEP and um, uh, the high school assessments. It's also the local assessments and the benchmarks that they were utilizing and trying to improve. And that actually gives us a better, I think, a better result than the MSTEP does. Gives us more information. Benchmarks are of the school district's choosing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ms. Snyder and then Dr. Pugh. So one of the most important goals to attain, whether it's local or state, would be proficiency and literacy. So I have, I have a couple questions regarding that. Were there any partnership districts that didn't include that as a local goal? Yes. Okay. That there were district partnership districts that did not include proficiency in literacy improvement as a local goal. Yeah, they have to have one proficiency goal per 22P, but they didn't all have a literacy goal back in 2017 and 2018. They will in the round four, focus on literacy. We are going to make that a requirement that we work with districts. I agree with you on that. <clears throat> I, I sure hope so. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is this concept of, you know, as long as you meet two thirds or one third of the local and state goals, then you can be removed as a partnership district. Is it possible that even under the requirement of a literacy goal, proficiency and literacy goal, that you could still be removed as a partnership district and not check that box? There, that, that's a possibility. However, districts that at three years from now, after round four happen, all districts in round one, two, and three are, are released because of the COVID and because of the pandemic. That's happening this fall. Then when round four districts are identified this fall and they write their three-year partnership agreements, we're going to have a different structure in terms of, you know, the different levels that we talked about and the accountability measures that they write in terms of what they're going to do if they don't meet their goals and they aren't successful will then be instituted in 2025. So we have a different system that we're putting in place. So, oh, and then on top of this, I, I, I'm not very, I'm not pleased to hear what you're saying. Um, the idea that we would wait until 2025 until these partnership districts would make that a goal as a requirement, please let me finish. And this concept of you don't have to meet the goal and you could end up being out of a partnership. And by the way, these are goals of just so the public is aware, two and a half percent increase or three percent increase. Some of these districts are 85 plus percent literacy gap. Two and a half and three percent is a drop in the bucket for these kids that cannot read. It is, it's wrong. If we want to provide a good education, we have to set goals. 
Dr. Pierce, goals that are like, meaningful. Would you like to clarify? Or would you like me to? Um, districts in a partnership agreement develop their own goals that they think they can attain. So there's, there's proficiency and there's growth. And we're going to focus more on growth. Partnership districts need to focus on the growth of the students, not attaining that level of proficiency. That's why they're in a partnership agreement. If you increase growth over three years, you will increase proficiency. And three years is not a long time. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Pugh. Um, first, it, it, since we were wor first working on the partnership districts, I mean, you all have done quite a bit uh, to build this out. Um, so definitely want to commend you on that. And I think um, to Tom's point, I would love to visit um, some of these districts uh, as well. Uh, just to be able to put that spotlight on what can be done when we're focusing on some of these processes, um, focusing on growth versus just proficiency. Yes, we do want to see um, all of these schools excel, but we do know that we're dealing with years, <coughs> decades of um, upstream factors that we're now able to address. I mean, you talked about addressing the whole child, um, putting more emphasis and focuses on that versus um, just the, a test score. And so I would like to, um, and again, I don't know if I said the word stigma, but you know, the stigma that has been out there on these schools by us just focusing in some of these areas that now um, the partnership model allows us to, um, to focus on something else and give those schools the room to to um, do more to address the, 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 the child and, you know, have better outcomes. So I would love to go there and put a spotlight that's not the negative stigma that they're usually seeing. One of the things that I'm just always interested in, I was really happy to see the um, continuous uh, improvement planning and just wondering how receptive districts are to that, how that's going, um, how that's working. Uh, just hear a little bit uh, about that. And then I saw that, you know, right up at the top, you separated from the A through F system. Like, are we seeing any issues there or anything that could creep up where we're um, not in alignment with, with these two, with those two um, accountability systems? So I'm, I'm going to take um, the first part of the first question, and I'll let Dr. Chapman finish up with my kit, but I do want to go back if I can, Dr. And Rice. then Andy Middlestead will handle the third of the Yes, three. thank you, perfect. Thank you. Um, something that Ms. Snyder said, I, I don't want um, people to think that the district set a goal or the school district, the school sets a goal and they don't, um, aren't accountable for it for three years. That's not the case we the, the district or the school sets the goal and is monitored by the office of partnership district um, on a monthly basis on a yearly basis in hopes to get to the attainment that they need to get to i'll talk um, dr chapman will handle the mic kip and then um andy middlestead will talk about the alignment of a to f and the school index <coughs> system thank you dr carnell and good morning dr Pugh. as it relates to my kip our Michigan continuous improvement process. <clears throat> We're very happy to share today, so thanks for the question. As of, I believe, two weeks ago, we have 100% of all of the districts in our state that have committed to MICIP. That process um, of obtaining that 100% outshines the previous system, which averaged, we did dug into some data, the highest um, collection of schools that participated was 98%. So moving forward, as we are beginning with this coming school year, it is a requirement for all LEAs to participate and to gather their data, establish data stories so that they can be focusing on growth, which then leads to, <coughs> to proficiency. So my KIP is well on its way to doing what we want it to do. So thanks for the question. Can I just ask one um, yeah. So do we have mechanisms in place for them to quick, uh, quickly course correct when they're, when they're looking at their data? <clears throat> yes, because of the way the MyKIP platform is set up, 
because it is a digital platform and it automatically, based on the input of data, and there are several associated or synced data systems that also filter in data, not only just the school level data, um, they are able to continuously to review and to update their data stories and in real time be able to identify which research-based and evidence-based strategies will help them to meet the goals that are imprinted in their individual data stories. Thank you. And then to address the E to F assessments, our accountability system, can you repeat the question for me so I can make sure I can answer it thoroughly for you? Um, right up at the top, you all said, okay, th we're, we're only going to focus here. But And I was yeah. just wondering if, if we see anything um, coming up that could be where the two systems don't work, the two accountability systems right. don't Right. So match. I can briefly address that, certainly. So as we said earlier, the A to F system is the state-required system that the state law talks about. It di defines CSI slightly differently than the federal index system does. So... It's a completely unique system in many ways, but when we get down to identification of those different categories, there is quite a bit of overlap, but it's not quite the same. So that's one of the things we're working on is how do we support these schools that might be identified slightly differently, but uh, it is a completely different system. The largest component of it is that it does not create an overall indicator like an index score is a series of individual letter grades like we've seen before. So uh, that's one of the things that we are working on um, now is what do we do with some of these uh, schools that might have different identifications based on that A to F system. The other thing is, is that the, um, the A through S system is fixated on state summative results, mm -hmm. whereas the index system is the first accountability system that the state has had in 20 years that's not wholly fixated on state summative assessments. And that's a function of movement at the federal level. You may recall that the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001 signed into law uh, by, by then President Bush in January 8, 2002, really pushed the primacy of these, uh, of these state summative assessment results. And that, that went uh, through the entire Bush administration, through virtually the entire Obama administration. It didn't really change until the passage of ESSA in, in 2015. And then, and then our ESSA-approved accountability system in 2017. So you really had a period of time for about 15 years where the focus was entirely state summative assessments. And that was federal policy driven down. Uh, to the states and into the, the local districts. The, the index accountability system, which I think is a, a stronger accountability system, is the first one to, 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 include account, to include state summative assessments, yes, but to not solely include state summative assessments. Um, so you'll notice that um, you go back to that preceding slide. If we could go back to that early slide that uh, cuts up um, the index system, it notes that, for example, 34% is associated with growth in state summative assessments. 29% is associated with proficiency in state summative assessments. And you get a, a, a gestalt category of 14%. It's, it's, kind of, it's got several different elements in it, including chronic absenteeism. Uh, the, the power of this is it get, gives you a, a more rounded sense of what a school is. I, I'm not going to say that it's a perfectly rounded sense, but it's certainly better than No Child Left Behind. It's certainly better than Race to the Top. And it's certainly better, uh, in my view, than A through F as, as well. To your question about overlap, and that's what I heard you, you asking about. Your, yours was, a, yours was a, a, if you will, a statistician's question about, about overlap. Well, we don't know precisely what the overlap is because we've not run the right. one set against the other this time. We believe, based upon um, uh, previous experience, that the overlap will be quite substantial. Will it be perfect? It will not. Will it be substantial? It will be. Proof's in the pudding, and we'll know better in the next three to four months. Um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Tilly, 
I apologize. I, I, I wish I had a, a fly's peripheral mm -hmm. vision. <laughs> no worries. Um, I'm not sure if this happens um, already or not, but if it doesn't, it would be really great to have an annual report that has the data of, um, of, of the school districts and all of the things that they've done to correct the issues, you know, to highlight the schools that have um, come out of this situation and how they did it, mm -hmm. um, to Tom's point for that. And um, not only for us, but so that those partnership districts can see the report as well, so they can see what, what schools have done. Sure. So to that point and to the point that was made earlier about uh, sort of uh, Mr. McMillan's how we doing um, question and, and then to Ms. Snyder, Dr. Pugh, and Ms. Tilly. Um, EPIC MRA, let me try it again. Um, EPIC at MSU, there are a lot of EPICs. <laughs> um, EPIC at MSU has done three reports on the partnership district model. The fourth report is in draft form and it will be released in the coming weeks. Is that going to be an annual report? It, it, is, it is roughly an annual report um, that they've been doing these reports throughout the duration of the partnership model. The partnership model dates back to 17, so they'll have done four reports in five years. So I'm not saying it's, it's perfectly an annual model, but it's ish annual, that's a technical <laughs> term. Um, and what those reports have shown is that um, they, they have some measure of optimism associated with the, the model. You know, it's a model that's in its beginning, it's in its infancy. It would be a little bit more mature had we had two more years of state assessments, had we not had a pandemic, and, and, and. But they believe that there's strength in the model and that, that we should uh, additionally support the model. Have they done a presentation for us on their report? It would be great if they did a presentation, yeah. don't you think? Yes. I agree with that. Okay. All right. So um, if we can, if we if if we can get an amen in the church for a presentation from Epic, um, Epic is the entity that has studied the model most extensively. Um, its reports are somewhat prolific. Um, I won't say that they're um, uh, war and peace length, but they are somewhere between war and peace. They're quite long and quite thorough, and I believe that uh, uh, Dr. Strunk would be willing to come and present to the State Board. In fact, I believe that she presented a year ago, um, uh, but, um, but certainly worth coming back and, and uh, representing. I think that there's a value to that. Um, other questions, comments, concerns, fears, phobias? Dr. Pugh. Just, uh, I know Benton Harbor is separate, but can we get an update um, there? Maybe yep. we got one recently, I can't right. recall, but. So, so Benton Harbor had a separate status, it is true. It had a separate status under state statute. That separate status disappeared in the lame duck session of 2018, effective June 30th, 2019. So um, it, it, depending upon what its assessment results are, it may or may not be subject to uh, one or, or more of these designations. So we'll have, we'll have more to share w w with you in the, in the late fall on that, not simply with Benton Harbor, but with all, all, right. with all districts. Mr. McMillan, back to you. Since we've got 15 more minutes, I don't feel bad in digging deeper because, again, I said this is, I think, one of the most important functions of this body. But um, have we, have you all learned anything since you started? Are we doing something, are you all doing something different? Um, you know, just, I'm talking about kind of the guts of what you do. I mean, is it, has, have you kind of evolved a little bit since uh, beginning this? Yes. So, you know, I wasn't here in the beginning in writing the initial partnership agreements, but I think some of the things that we've learned is that the title partnership really has taken off. The partnership between the district and uh, OPD, um, I believe, has really materialized. The liaisons get the support from us, from the MDE, 
They work in the district. The districts trust the liaisons. They tell me that. I visited all districts last fall, talked to the leadership. Um, in fact, several of them said, I want to retain the liaison if we're re-identified you know, next fall. Um, change in leadership at some of the CSI buildings, some of the principals have been changed because of the process. I think that has led to higher achievement for students and a more organized system, specifically with uh, PSAs, but also within traditional districts. So we have learned, um, we've also learned that we are going to require a little bit more um, accountability for districts that are in the intensive level that we just talked about. Um, the director and assistant or assistant director are going to be involved in writing the agreements, you know, involved in the buildings. So uh, we have learned that um, the districts now feel better. And I think EPIC would report that out because in the beginning, as Dr. Rice mentioned, it was a different concept. You know, we were talking about closing schools, and you've mentioned that too, Tom. Uh, that's not the case. We're talking about improving schools. We're talking about maybe reconstituting schools if they don't meet their goals at the end of round four. Um, so I, we have learned a lot, and we have learned uh, how to write the benchmarks and goals to a better degree so that when we work with round four districts, we will do a better job, we being Office of Partnership Districts. Okay. And then I guess I would still like to push for some kind of parental satisfaction. I still think that uh, hearing with the parents, you know, surveying them before, surveying them after, letting them, you know, because things that we may perceive as important may not be as important to parents or something that is important to them we may not understand as well or, or you all might not or the school might not. So I just, uh, like safety or whatever. I mean, there could be factors in there that they just want to, I still think that parental satisfaction should be in there somewhere, but anyway, thank you. I, I, I just want to um, pause there because I think there's something to be said for that. Um, we do parental satisfaction in a lot of different ways in different schools. Yes. In some cases we survey and there's a value to the surveying. Um, so I'd like to um, add my amen to that reflection. But I think we also look at parent satisfaction in other ways as well. Um, the extent to which a school holds its enrollment. I'm always amused when an outside force tells a local school or local school district that the school is failing when parents in a choice system choose to send their children there. Um, they, they, and it's not because the school is around the corner. Um, these are parents that are so committed to a given school in a given district that they, that they put their children on a bus and the children ride 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 45 minutes one way to the school, notwithstanding um, the external perception of uh, challenge relative to the state assessment. So I believe, uh, like I think you're saying, Mr. McMillan, that a school is far more than narrow numbers in a given day. Um, it is a sense of welcoming. It's a sense of belonging. It's a sense of, of children being able to self-actualize, uh, being able to develop, being safe. I think all of those are factors, and um, to survey, I think, is is a, is a really important um, element um, of that. I do think enrollment fluctuations tell us some of that, but in a gross way, not in a, that is to say, in an aggregate way, not in a not in a more refined way. So, so anyway, I don't want to don't wanna belabor it. But I do think that there's a value to that um, that surveying. Other um, other thoughts or questions for board members? Once, twice, thrice, hearing and seeing none. Gentle people, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, we look forward to seeing you back um, in the fall. Presentation um, on diversity, equity, and inclusion contains information on selected department efforts 
regarding um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, how these efforts support the goals of Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan. We welcome our presenters, backed by popular demand, Dr. Sue Carnell, Chief Deputy Superintendent, Ms. Renee Garcia, Director of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. Presenters, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice, and hello again, members of the State Board of Education. Uh, Renee Garcia and I are here to present the department's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. For this presentation, we will focus on Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan, which the board adopted in 2020. The state's strategic education plan aims to provide focused direction to Michigan's education community in support of all learners through these eight goals. To begin our presentation, I'm using goal five to increase the percentage of all students who graduate from high school. As an example of the data we can use to look at the differences revealed in the outcome. Here you see the overall four-year graduation rate for the 2022 school year. The graduation for the 21-22 for the school year. The graduation rate for the 21, um, the, the graduation rate here is for the 2020-2021 school year. The graduation rate for the 21-22 school year will be released in February of 23. <laughs> All right. As we look closer at Goal 5, we will see differential outcomes that are undeniable. This slide shows areas of difference among outcomes in ethnicity. This information helps the department and LEAs focus on strategies to influence better outcomes for students. This slide shows the differences between our students who are economically disadvantaged and those students who are not economically disadvantaged. Slide six shows the differences between our students with disabilities. And this slide shows the differences between our students who are English learners. Since we want all of our students in Michigan, regardless of ethnicity, economic status, disability, or English learners to graduate from high school, Ms. Garcia will highlight some of the department's selected efforts that relate to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you, Dr. Carnell, and good morning, board. I'll begin by sharing what we mean when we talk about these terms. So diversity means differences or varieties. This could be diversity or variety of students, teachers, families, or programs. Inclusion means welcoming. It also means um, individuals feel that they have a sense of belonging. Equity means fairness and access. We work to ensure that students have fair opportunities and access to education and resources. Efforts are sometimes singular, sometimes dual, and sometimes fit into all three categories as demonstrated by this Venn diagram. Likewise, efforts often affect more than one goal. Today we will share several efforts that affect more than one goal, efforts that span across more than one goal but have the greatest effect on a particular goal will be listed in the goal area where there is the most relevance. It is important to note that efforts listed are examples of work happening across the department and within local education agencies, and this list is not exhaustive. Goal one, expanding early childhood learning opportunities. The first effort listed is expanding the Great Start Readiness Program, or GSRP. GSRP provides preschool for four-year-olds, improving access to preschool for children who are homeless, in foster care, have an IEP, or are from economically disadvantaged homes. The Preschool Inclusion Collective Action Plan focuses on improving access to preschools and childcare settings for three to five-year-olds with disabilities in an effort to ensure welcoming settings with their non-disabled peers. Early on services to identify and meet the needs of children birth to three years of age who have disabilities, developmental delays, or are suspected to. 
Early on helps families access social, health, and educational services for their infants and toddlers with special needs. Goal two, improving early literacy achievement. The Comprehensive Literacy State Development Grant, a $16 million competitive five-year federal grant, is permitting additional opportunities and access to improve literacy achievement in Detroit, Pontiac, Flint, Benton Harbor, and Muskegon Heights School Districts. Accelerated learning guidance was provided by the department to local districts to keep students moving forward on their intended grade level path despite the interruptions caused by the pandemic. The guidance urges teachers to maintain high expectations and provide just-in-time instruction and content students need so they can access current grade level material. A list of authors of color and their works of literature developed by the department including the Library of Michigan, is a teacher resource that celebrates a variety of cultures and ethnicities. The diversity in literature effort supports educators to build classroom libraries full of books that engage and excite children. Libraries are powerful when they contain books with a variety of cultures represented, ensuring that each child can not only learn about others, but can also see themselves, their culture, and their dreams reflected in the literature that they read. Teaching comprehensive history is supported by webinars for teachers that increase their access to content knowledge of historical movements. Anti-bias question review for state level assessments is supported by committees of educators with different geographic, ethnic, and English learning expertise, as well as special education expertise. Here are four examples of efforts that align with goal three, improve the health, safety, and wellness of all learners. The expansion of mental health supports provides more access to resources. Increase in helping professionals improved access for students by adding at least 600 social workers, psychologists, counselors, and nurses to Michigan schools. The pandemic has shown access to support is necessary for kids in all our Michigan schools. These two efforts offer increased access, especially where geography or costs are challenges and where there are fewer helping professionals available. The Social Emotional Learning and Children's Mental Health Network works to build a school-based mental health system throughout Michigan schools that can provide a variety of supports to help students be successful as they navigate difficult times in their lives. The Food and Nutrition Program provides access to students who need meals. Efforts under goal four expand secondary learning opportunities for all students, include advanced placement, career and technical education, dual enrollment, and early middle college. Across Michigan, there are a variety of students with a variety of interests. The department is working with local education agencies to grow these efforts because access to them should not depend on where a student lives. Successful efforts in goals one, two, three, and four support goal five, increase the percentage of all students who graduate from high school. Additionally, the Early Warning Intervention and Monitoring System, or EWIMS, assists schools in identifying which students need different supports to increase the likelihood of graduation. A personal curriculum can offer students a path to graduation that is individualized and respects the different learning needs of students. Goal six of Michigan's top 10 strategic plan seeks to increase the percentage of adults with post-secondary credentials. Certificates and in industry-recognized certifications are offered through career and technical education programs. Advanced placement, dual enrollment, and early middle college programs are supportive pathways to earning associate, bachelor's, or graduate and professional degrees. These efforts offer different opportunities, allowing learners to decide the path that is best for them. Efforts to support goal seven, increase the number of certified teachers in all areas of shortage, include two future proud Michigan educator programs, grow your own support staff to teachers and grow your own students to teachers. These programs offer access by providing financial support to candidates, encouraging candidates that represent different ethnicities to diversify the educator workforce, and often the programs are provided within the local communities. All students, including those with IEPs, deserve highly qualified and certificated teachers. 
special education certification flexibilities have allowed certificated teachers without spe specific endorsements to teach students with disabilities, thus allowing students greater access to the general education curriculum, and in some cases, offering students more inclusive environments. Goal eight, provide adequate and equitable school funding. The fiscal year 23 budget includes additional money to continue building a weighted funding model to address the different costs associated with educating students with different needs, such as at-risk students, English learners, and costs associated with special education. The efforts on this slide cross multiple goals, providing structure for the work of the department and local education agencies. A multi-tiered system of supports considers the individual assets and needs of students, providing access to resources and supports as they are needed. Schools and districts use Michigan's continuous improvement process as they work to provide access to educational opportunities for all of their students. Least restrictive environment allows for fairness and access to education for children with an individual, individualized education plan by supporting their participation in general education to the extent possible. Child find is a process that districts use to identify, locate, and evaluate children with a suspected disability for special education services to ensure they have access to education. The Indigenous Education Initiative team works to ensure that all students will benefit from welcoming Indigenous perspectives and knowledge systems into the existing educational opportunities and structures. English learner supports provide English language development and meaningful access to core curriculum with the support of appropriately certified and endorsed staff. Translation services improve family access to materials and resources. An example is having our sign language interpreters in our board meetings. We appreciate the opportunity to share selected efforts of diversity, equity, and inclusion across the department and within local education agencies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carnell, Ms. Garcia, board members, questions or comments? Ms. Gill. Thank you for the presentation. This is really good. I wanted to know what is being done to um, help educate districts and educators about DEI um, because it can be very controversial in some of the districts. And so, you know, I, we have African-American cities listed, um, which is great that they're, they're getting the grant and support. Um, but they, they're listed as far as making sure they have works for the authors of color. Um, it's just as important for those districts that are not um, majority African American or people of color, I know that those districts really, um, some of them are really having a hard time with DEI. So how are we working with those districts to educate them? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I'll go back to the diversity and literature series as an example of some of that work. So it's our goal really to get that work um, to the classroom. And when we look at that, we're looking at the um, asking teachers to reflect upon who the students are in their classroom and to really look for mirrors and windows for their students. So regardless of the, the ethnicities in the classroom, every child should see themselves represented in the books that they have the ability to access and to read, but also learn about other cultures. So absolutely right in that diversity in literature guidance and webinars support that. Have you guys seen any pushback? I, I personally haven't seen any pushback. The people who have come to those webinars have been very appreciative of the work and the support. Thank you. You're welcome. The, um, Ms. Tilly, to your question, um, each of the four diversity and literacy webinars that we've done from January of 2021 through this summer in 2022 had more than 1,000 educators mm -hmm. attend. There's a hunger of teachers to uh, understand, um, learn about, and then be able to, to share um, diversity in literature. They recognize that there's a value to 
teaching all children about diversity in literature, to uh, Ms. Garcia's um, language, invoking the, the, um, the words of Dr. Rudin Sims Bishop, that kids should see themselves in their literature mirrors, they should see others in their literature windows, and they should be able to enter others' lives if they so choose um, sliding doors. And um, it's not to say that every child's going to be interested in every book, that's not the point, but you ought not to go through your entire life, your entire childhood, your entire education without seeing yourself in a, in a book, or for it to be epiphanous when you get to eighth or ninth grade and finally see yourself in a book. You ought to periodically see yourself in books as you ought to periodically see others in books. You referenced um, the, the federal grant. That was a federal grant that we saw. It was a competitive federal grant that permits us to work with these five districts, which you cited, not solely around diversity and literacy, although that's a piece of it, but around really creating a literacy um, community and, 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 and a literacy structure. And that's challenging for, for a whole host of, um, of ways. But, but I can tell you that that work is ongoing. Um, and at some point in the, in the next 12 months, um, we'll share um, lessons learned from that work as well. And I, I definitely you know, think that that's great that they got that grant. And it's really needed. <coughs> um, and the support is really needed. I just know that. In Oakland County, there has been some a lot of debates in some districts when it comes to DEI. It's mm -hmm. been controversial, so I was wondering um, how we can better educate some of our districts and educators in that area. I think a lot um, turns on what you call diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so we believe diverse literature um, is, falls within that sort of umbrella. Um, we don't view that to be overly unnerving. If you can see me in a book when you're in third grade, you ought to be able to see you in a book in a third grade. Uh, we ought to each be able to see one another in books in, in third grade. And um, we are, in fact, both parts of the state, both parts of the country. We ought to be represented in the literature that young people read. That is the spirit in which we do diversity in literacy. Nothing more, no, nothing less. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> yes, um, Ms. Snyder and then Dr. Pugh. Just looking at the selected effort goal number three for mental health supports expansion and increasing psychologists and counselors, and I know we talked about it in June, the concept of creating a comprehensive mental health system within education, which is a topic in and of itself, but for the sake of this particular presentation, and just sort of tie in everything we're talking about, every child should see themselves represented in a comprehensive mental health support. One of the current concerns I have, and I think it's significant, a lot of parents have expressed this across the state, is so the relationship between spirituality and psychology is often very intimate for, for students and families and parents. So, um, and, and when you mix that in with mainstream psychology, which is often secular education and practice, I think to myself, will students and parents have access to mental health supports that align with their spirituality, because where we're at with public education, separation of church and state, all, all discussion considered, I, I don't see us going in that direction. So I have to ask the honest question, will we have access without that secular bias, or will students at least have access to dollars in which they can receive services that are aligning with their differences and the variety they offer? I don't have the specific answer to that question, but I can get it for you. Yeah, and I think, um, Kyle, would you like to, to weigh in at all on that? Our Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations, um, under which we have the Office of Health and Nutrition Services, which has mental health within it. Sure. I, I would, <clears throat> from, from my experience to your question, uh, Ms. Snyder, 
for students and families that may have those concerns, districts work to try and find those supports outside of the school system, so in a community-based organization or with the CMH. Um, so, I mean, that, that's my experience. Now, if you're asking if there's going to be a diversity of providers in any given school building that's going to be able to um, provide varying levels of support that's going to be maybe more secular focus or non-secular focus, there's a, a provider shortage um, all across our state right now. So I think that's a, a high bar to try and reach um, because we don't have enough providers to provide crisis care for students, let alone that level of service I think you're uh, alluding to. Thank you. Other, uh, other questions? No. Okay. Dr. Pugh, Ms. Lipton. And I think it, uh, to, um, to your question, board member, member Snyder, I, I, and to Kyle's point, I have worked at the local level where community tries to come together. I mean, and as long as that entity is not um, trying to convert a child, then, then, then we've seen where, the, where those entities are able to, to work together or proselytize a, 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 as long as the religion isn't the, the piece that's weighing, the weighing factor. Um, and I get a lot of questions too about what, the, what we're doing as a department um, to address uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we've talked a lot mm -hmm. and would love to see a list of all the things that the department is doing um, from getting having the DEI director to the office, um, some of the things that you have listed here. I guess I could share this presentation, um, but there is a lot of great work um, that is going on. And and um, thank you for leading those efforts, and especially in a time such as this. And I think to board member Tilly's point is we know that our local districts are going to need more support. We get those questions where there's different issues that are going on in those districts. Um, and just and I know we've had to step up um, and try to pro provide some technical support. Uh, in those areas. One of the other um, things that I'll point out is that uh, NASB, National Association of State Boards of Education, has just instituted a justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, committee. And um, so JEDI is something that, of course, is being implemented to look internally um, to make sure that uh, uh, entities such as the Department of Education, that we have all the tools um, internally to then be able to carry out the great work um, that, that we're setting uh, forward. And I'm just wondering if we do have it, that makes me question whether we're doing anything internally um, and really happy to see diversification of our staff. You know, I've you know, been seeing that, um, but that's a, a question. So, um so there uh, is a lot of inward f focused uh, work uh, in the department. The department does not uh, want for inward facing work. Um, we've tried to, um, in the last three years, keep a consistent focus on our on our customers, on our on our children, um, on our parents, on our educators, um, and. Um, but periodically, you do have to look in the mirror to reflect upon how you're doing, what you're doing, um, how you can um, restructure resources, how you might be able to request additional resources, how you may be able to prune the tree in particular, in particular ways. I think all of that is, is important. We've <coughs> pushed very hard regarding diversity in um, um, hiring. Uh, I, I recently had an interview on the teacher shortage and a um, person, uh, she asked me, um, was there anything else I'd like to share? I'd say, I said, well, you know, we're, we're interested in the quality, quantity and quality of staff, but we're also interested in the diversity of staff. And, and oftentimes um, that gets lost in the shuffle. It shouldn't get lost in the shuffle in a state that's more than 36 percent um, children of color and only 10% teachers of color. We've added several hundred 
um, African American teachers in the last five years. We hope that that, that uh, extends uh, when when we get more data this uh, this fall. The focus on grow your own is not simply about quantity and quality. It's also about diversity as well because you do grow your own support staff to teachers, students to teachers. You're much more likely to get a diverse crop of teachers than if you simply um, wait for the profession to repopulate itself. And what you'll get is what you've gotten overwhelmingly. And uh, there's, there's nothing wrong um, with that in miniature, but if we're going to be a more representative profession, we're going to have to do it purposefully. It's not going to just happen. It's not going to be magical. I'd like to draw a link between what you shared at the beginning of your comments, Dr. Pugh, and what um, Ms. Snyder shared at the end of her comment. You know, we have a number of uh, faith-based professionals who are in our schools across the state. Um, in my former district, we created a mentoring program with hundreds of mentors. Many of those came from the churches. They were not simply the pastors, but they were the parishioners as well, um, often um, organized by a, a key member uh, a male or female in the congregation who felt strongly about the power of mentoring. Now, when they went into schools, the impetus for their mentoring may have been right. spiritual. Right. Um, that's not to say that their mentoring was spiritual per right. se, but the inspiration for it right. um, was, was spiritual. And we think that there's a real value in that regard. There's not only nothing that precludes it, there's everything that recommends it, but you do have to draw a line um, at, at some point because you can't, you, you're not able to advance a single religion right. or religion generally. Um, um, but you certainly can come from a church mm -hmm. and mentor a child. And we literally had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids mentored by, um, by faith-based, right. organized uh, mentors. Mm -hmm. We believe in this. We think that there's a value to it. Now, it, it falls a little bit shy of a mental health uh, professional, in fairness. Right. But we do believe that there's a value to having people from churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, uh, pouring into children in the, in the schools and mentoring. Other questions for um, Dr. Carnell and Ms. Garcia. Ms. Lipton. Yes, hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to know if you could explain um, the early warning intervention and monitoring system um, on slide 17. I'm not familiar with um, that particular uh, program. So yes, the um, early warning um, indicators takes a look at students who are, um, their attendance in school, their uh, passing rates of their current classes, and um, their discipline rates. And then derives from that who might need more support and what more support they might need based on, on how that's going. And by doing that, it, it, they, you look ahead um, from their uh, middle school to high school years to say if we can put these supports in place, it can help support students to get to graduation because we know those factors can get in the way of graduation. Just to make sure I understand, so you're actually starting uh, in the middle school. This early in intervention mm -hmm. could conceivably start as early as middle school. So I think I need to get back to you with the specifics, but my experience actually is, I've seen schools put that in place even earlier than middle even school. Earlier. Okay. Yes. The reason, yeah, the reason why I'm asking is I've been in the um, college attainment space for about a decade now through the, the uh, Michigan Promise Zones. And what we're finding, at least in so far as creating a college-going culture in a particular school district, and we're in the most economically distressed communities in the state. I mean, that's the reason why you become a Promise Zone, because we are an economically distressed community. 
Um, and what we're finding is that, number one, that the college attainment rate is a direct correlation to the college going culture of the of the community. In other words, if students feel that no, they have a reason to complete uh, high school on time because of the the promise of going to college, uh, tuition free path to an associate's degree, that has a direct correlation. However, what we have found through ten years of work is that oftentimes um, creating the college going culture uh, in the high school is too late. Um, because then we have to do a lot, an awful lot of remediation um, for the students to graduate on time. And so we're actually pushing our work back, really starting around third grade, but, per, but, but intentionally in the middle school. So. Um, so that's that's very good to know that insofar as graduation on time, your early intervention um, is beginning prior to high school, or middle school, and maybe even earlier. There are so many to your to your point, Ms. Lipton. There are so many indicators of challenge in our children early. Um, that, to listen to it. that that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 one thing to to acknowledge that they're there. It's another thing to do something um, about them. And these systems to which we refer, um, academic, uh, mental health, physical health, and and and, they're they're involved. They take years to put together and to structure properly in support of. Uh, of children. The children's mental health system that we are working on, on standing up in the state, um, is really um, a system that will take several years to do right. Um, and ultimately, once it, it is uh, strong in support of our young people, it will connect community mental health and children's uh, mental health in schools in, in really a, in a seamless fashion. That that there there is a distinction, in a fashion between school mental health and and community mental health, but it's a little bit of an artificial distinction when you when you think about it. Um, it it's really more place based than anything else. Our children are in schools ish 180 days a year, which means that out of they're out of school 185 days a year. The whole issue of community mental health is not simply when children are not in school but are outside of school, but it's also picking up their, their, their parents, their other family members, their community members, all of which affects uh, a, a, young, a young person. So, you know, I'm always, um, when I see a, an early warning system that purports to do more than we as educators for years did, looking at Michael when he walked in, and saw who was accompanying Michael or who wasn't accompanying Michael. Um, what did his hair look like when he came into school? Um, did he have food? Did, did he have the, the, the forms? Did, did he have a permission to go on a field trip? Um, when he came to school, was he all tied in a knot early and angry? And it took him hours to, to kind of you know, dial down so that he could get something accomplished in school. I mean, you can see the early warning signs as kids walk in a door um, from jump. You don't have to wait until middle or school, middle school or high school to see issues um, associated with early warning. The, the early warning signs are there um, early, early and often. It really is simply a function of how you're going to work and support that baby who doesn't have the requisite um, support for him or her. Um, other, um, thank you for sharing that. Mr. McMillan. On uh, slide 14, it talks about anti-bias question review. What Can you give an example of that? Sure. On state level ass assessments. Yeah, so um, one example would be to think about a question that maybe relates to a city. 
um, and has vocabulary that's tied to a city that a student from a rural population wouldn't have access to that background knowledge. So that's why the reviewers, the committees, are made up of people from different geographic areas, um, as well as um, have different their own educational different experiences so that they can review those questions and make sure they're fair to all the students that take the question. What does that mean, a city? I mean, can you give more a better example? What are you talking about? So if I were going to talk about um, public transportation and there wasn't access to public transportation for students in rural populations, that might be an example. Okay. And just to make sure that when we talk about diversity in literature, we're not talking about, you know, making sure that there's uh, literature that has sexualization of children or anything like that. We're, what, what kind of diversity in literature are you talking about? Uh, we're so, talking. So, so, socioeconomic, um, ethnic, um, language of origin, country of origin. Um, we're talking about children being able to see themselves in their, in their literature. Okay. But it wouldn't include anything that would be controversial, like teaching first graders about, you know, sexualization or anything like that? I think that, um, I think it's a field of what we mean when we talk about diversity and literacy. When we talk about diversity and literacy, we are talking about um, children seeing themselves ethnically, socioeconomically, okay. um, and, and, and in there. Um, I, I, there was a beautiful book written a um, few years ago about a child who was homeless. It was entitled Hold Fast from the, the Langston Hughes poem, Mother to Son. Um, I, I beg your pardon, Langston Hughes' poem, um, Dreams, hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. And um, it was a beautiful, um, albeit tough, depiction of what it was for that child and his family to be homeless and, and, and his clinging to a particular book at that, at, that, at that time. Okay. And then teaching comprehensive history, how is that any different than what we've, what's been taught in the past? So I can tell you, we've had two webinars on teaching comprehensive history, one in April and one in June. Uh, the April one was uh, entitled Remembering the Holocaust, so all about the Holocaust survivor stories, artifacts, helping teachers learn about those so that they can use those in their lesson design. The second one was with our um, Confederation of Michigan Tribal Education Departments, and they created a resource that helps, um, that is, takes this, our Michigan social studies standards and looks for resources that help teach the social studies standards that are aligned to indigenous education. And so they, that is something new and different to be able to have teachers have resources that have been vetted from from that group. That was entitled Mondongenen. Thank you. Right? So, so a <laughs> yeah. gathering together of, of, of resources or knowledge. And to right? teach history through themes. Or through themes. And then, the, <coughs> and then finally, the, uh, the next uh, slide about safety, uh, improving health and safety. I mean, is there a, an interest in getting kind of at incentives? I mean, when I when I read that uh, letter from Dr. Kushner, where she got fired in, in Macomb County after 30 years of being their psychiatrist because she exposed some, you know, I guess a child said that he, or a student said he had a rifle in his locker. Uh, she did a, an evaluation. It was a covered up. It was destroyed. She got fired. I don't know all the details, but certainly the incentives are to have a district say that we don't have any problems. Because if they do, then all of a sudden people get concerned and there could be all kinds of stuff. So, you know, are, is there an effort? And, and I hope that there's, she's, Dr. Kushner says no, nobody's done anything about this, but I hope there's going to be some kind of a understanding of what happened there. But, um, you know, is there kind of an alignment of incentives that, uh, you know, just because something might you know, cast a bad light initially, uh, you know, maybe something got through. She talked about safety concerns about people, you know, going in and stealing things, uh, you know, that might sound bad initially, but if you don't expose it, then you don't deal with it. So I, I don't know, is there an interest uh, in kind of 
really looking at incentives to make sure issues aren't covered up in the safety area. So I, I, I'm going to I'm going to address that because um, I think <clears throat> at at one point in our history there may have been some um, perverse interest on the part of some to not share more broadly. I think that's over uh, for for many communities. I think so many of our communities realize that um, there are profound children's mental health issues. I remember in 2016 going to something at our RISA, stepping out of the room, going to the restroom, coming back, and um, this was on the issue of children's mental health. And I remember listening to this educator and thinking, this is weird. We're the only urban district in this RISA. <coughs> and the language she is using is language that I associate with um, challenges in urban education, and yet she's a rural educator. And um, that was, for me, an epiphany in 2016, that the issues that um, we were facing in urban jurisdictions were in rural jurisdictions, were in suburban jurisdictions, um, and um, s struck to hear um, how similar the language across types of educators um, was. You heard from the UP, the Western UP uh, ISD superintendents in October of last year. I thought that they were very open. They came and spoke at a state board meeting about concerns with children's mental health. In, uh, in their I ISDs at, in the Western UP. I think, Mr. McMillan, I think the point is it's late in the day. And um, well, I, I mean, think this just happened, so yeah. apparently it's still an issue. I can't speak to um, the specifics of an individual uh, employee or contractor in an individual ISD in a, in a given state. What I, what I can tell you is to quote or paraphrase from a former RISA superintendent of mine who said that his father uh, always told him that every uh, story has at least two sides, sometimes more. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Snyder. But we do have a pattern that is developing, and we've seen it in our state this last year. When administrators and local schools don't have the capacity to honor red flags, um, people don't just get fired, they get killed. And, and my issue with a comprehensive mental health system built within schools when there is a pediatric mental health system outside of schools that should be referred out to. That's the most, in my opinion, based on experience, based on the issues that we have talked about at this table, based on the issues that continue to happen in school districts as it relates to red flags, based on diversity and true equity, right? We have students that would not be served by a mental health support system if we're going to draw a line and say, but public education can't advance religion. Well, public education sh also shouldn't be advancing creed or ideology, and yet we are. So you've got multiple issues as it relates to why it doesn't make sense for public education in its place to do anything other than to refer out in emergency situations. But then that would mean if you really believe in red flags, you have to have red flag thinking. If you don't have red flag thinking, then you just have red flags that are ignored. So I, I don't know. If you've read in depth uh, the letter that she wrote, she's reached out to our board multiple times. It's actually very similar to things that not haven't just happened recently with her situation. Um, but in Oxford, I think it's, it's, it's significant. And it should be informing us as we move forward. Well, I, I, I would simply say that... Um, I appreciate your, your concerns, and um, I, I'm hopeful that you will join us in um, uh, supporting and urging the passage by our state legislature of red flag laws, because uh, we should certainly need them in our, in our state. Um, board, it is 1130. We appreciate our presenters. Thank you very much. We are going to pivot to the state and uh, federal update uh, now. Uh, we've got a little bit of time before lunch. And uh, sometimes this gets uh, less attention, perhaps, than it deserves.
Next item on today's agenda is a state and federal legislative update. Mr. Marty Ackley, our Director of Public and Governmental Affairs, will lead the state and federal legislative update, followed by uh, Ms. Lipton, a report on the SBE Legislative Committee. Uh, and uh, finally, Dr. Pritchard for uh, her half-hour report on NASB. Yeah, at least. No other questions. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Um, not much legislative uh, information to share as the legislature has been on recess uh, for much of the summer. There was an election, a primary election uh, at the beginning of August. And um, our legislative team, Dr. Cheryl Kennedy and Stephen DeGro, have put together some a summary of some of the interesting things um, from that primary election. Um, one thing, uh, there will be 58 new member seats in the House of Representatives in the next session, meaning no House incumbent from either party will be running. Three of the seats include current senators running for the House, Senator Zorn, Wozniak, and Vanderwall. Um, that means that more than half of the House will be freshmen next term. In the Senate, uh, there will be 15 new member seats, meaning that no Senate incumbent from either party is running. Uh, seven of these seats have uh, Republican candidates from the House running for the Senate, and six of the seats have Democratic candidates from the House who are running for the Senate. There is one Senate seat that is going to be of tremendous interest, uh, Senate race. Uh, Representative Hornberger, who is the chair of the House Education Committee, um, is running against Representative Kevin Hertel um, in Macomb County for that Senate seat there. Um, so that's the only um, general election seat where there are two sitting House members running um, against each other in the Senate. So um, that was interesting, I thought. And as far as incumbents um, running for re-election, there are 12 sitting Republican members who are running in the Senate. 11 sitting Democratic members are running in the Senate. Um, there is no case of a sitting Republican and Democratic senator running against each other. Um, there is a, a race in West Michigan where we have two um, House members running against each other, um, Representative Brand and Representative Brinks. Uh, one Democrat, one Republican running against each other for a Senate seat um, there in the Grand Rapids area. On the House side, 24 sitting Republican members are running uh, for re-election. Uh, 28 sitting Democratic members in the House are running for re-election. There are no currently seated House members running against each other in the general in spite of the new redrawn district boundaries. Um, so that's uh, interesting information as we head into the... Uh, Next session, and also as the um, the rest of this session goes on, the Senate will be, I mean, the legislature will be coming back in September for a month before they go on recess again in October to work in their districts, um, probably putting up yard signs and handing out information to their uh, to their constituents. Um, so that's what I basically have to report from from my end, and I'd like to defer to Chairman Lipton uh, regarding the. Uh, State Board Legislative Committee meeting at met last week. Before we move to Chairwoman Lipton, if I if I could, 58 uh, minimally, uh, a minimum of 58 new members. There may be more, right. but we know because there's no incumbent running in 58 of the 110 general election races that there will be at least 58 new members right. in the House. Yes, thank you, Ms. Lipton. Thank you, Mr. Hackley. Um, we had our um, legislative committee meeting um, after uh, being on hiatus in July. Um, and the, the focus of the meeting was really, um, in my mind, to really prepare for lame duck. We're not quite in lame duck yet. Um, because we haven't gone through the November election, but we're sort of moving in that direction. Um, and there's a rhythm to the legislature um, that there are some opportunities during this time um, to get what I would call more um, nuts and bolts sort of things done. And so in preparation for that, we really discussed um, what, the department's legislative priorities might be uh, between now and the end of the year. Um, one of the issues is maybe a little bit of inside baseball, but I do think it's something that we've discussed at, we've discussed at the legislative committee for several months now, and I just want to bring it to the fold 
board's attention. Um, right now, the department, um, when they uh, recruit people who have been coming from the um, teaching profession, there is an issue of a inability to mesh two retirement systems. The state has a system that's known as mixers for public school employees, and then I believe the state employees is SIRS. Um, and in Lansing, in the legislature, whenever you talk about MIPSERS or SIRS, there's always this hesitancy to, to touch anything and do anything. But I really think that this is a very, very good idea and a very elegant solution to um, an issue of uh, recruiting people. And the idea would be um, to allow people who have had experience in teaching come into the department um, without necessarily losing the um, seniority that they have achieved in the MIPSER system. Um, so it would allow them, and this would all be you know, optional, this is not something that would be mandatory, but would allow for that employee to continue um, uh, to stay within MIPSERs and not necessarily lose that. I do think it would have the ability for the department to have a little bit of um, uh, flexibility in uh, recruiting people. Um, and as we've heard, the, the work of the department is not getting any less. It's getting, you know, it's getting greater. Um, I also think it would be a sort of a, a, a professional freedom for someone who's been a teacher <coughs> who might want to try um, uh, non-classroom, but also staying in the teaching profession work in the department um, without having the barrier of thinking about the inability of the two retirement systems to mesh. Um, that, so that particular, it, it would require um, a change in statute. I do think it's something that would be really appropriate for Lane Duck. Um, and um, uh, I am hopeful that um, Office of Retirement Services, ORS, um, which does have to do a review um, uh, and make sure that it's, it's not going to have any um, adverse impact on either retirement system. Um, I hope that they will ultimately approve it. Um, whether or not it's something that could be drafted and championed and passed before the end of the year, I don't know. Um, but it certainly is something that I think works well for um, an end of the year push or effort. Um, and so uh, in the coming um, meetings, uh, we may, the legislative committee may be coming back and asking for this board's uh, approval in terms of a resolution and support of. We haven't made that decision yet, but that's really um, something to, uh, you know, to, I think uh, to be thinking about. Um, on the theme of, you know, removing barriers, if you will, and, you know, um, uh, you know freedom to, um, to practice your profession, um, removing administrative barriers, what have you. We talked about um, a bipartisan package of bills being shepherded by Senator McBroom and Senator McCann. Um, Senator McCann has the Counselor Reciprocity Bill. Uh, guidance Counselor Reciprocity Bill, and Senator McBroom, I believe, has the uh, Teacher Reciprocity Bill. Um, and these two bills, um, 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 they, I think, also would be really, really appropriate for lame duck. Um, uh, and my understanding is that they are working on getting um, the, um, the 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 okay. Uh, of um, Senate Education Chair for, for hearings. Um, but this again, when we're talking about trying to alleviate the teacher shortage, um, which we've been talking about for, for many, many months, um, and certainly ramping up our ability to hire more mental health professionals, 
in the coming school year, removing uh, barriers for out-of-state professionals uh, to be able to get certified. Again, we are not minimizing these bills. When you read the bills, it's not minimizing standards or what have you. These are people that were certified in other state, practice their profession, um, um, but may um, have an impediment uh, to uh, re retesting and what have you. So it would remove uh, some of the barriers to allow for um, these teachers that have been practicing their profession in other states to come to Michigan um, and be able to uh, work in our school districts. Um, so those bills, um, really, they've been drafted. They have bipartisan support. But it's really now a question of them um, getting a hearing in the Senate. Um, and if they do get a hearing, my expectation is that <coughs> it will move quickly. But right now, the impediment, if you will, is getting it scheduled for a hearing over in the Senate. Um, so um, that's, what, that's what we're working on. The, the reciprocity bills to which um, Ms. Lipton refers are extraordinarily important. Um, we are heavily involved in reciprocity in the state of Michigan. Um, each of the last five years for which there are data, more than 1,000 teachers were initially certified outside of the state, subsequently certified inside the state. This is not new. This is the ability to extend upon what we have done. The most recent year for which there is data, 1,326 people initially certified outside of the state subsequently certified inside the state. 31% of all those certificated in Michigan were initially certified uh, outside of the state. Uh, so we've been in this space. This would just remove a barrier and would permit us to do a little bit more of this in the short run. And then in the midterm, long term, as uh, the impact of uh, higher school budgets, uh, the ability to pay the teachers and support staff members more um, takes hold. The ability to support teachers in classrooms takes hold. The ability for teachers to feel more efficacious about their job because they are better supported um, and better compensated takes hold. The profession improves and the need for um, the reciprocity uh, diminishes to some degree. But in the <laughs> short term, this is important. This is as quick and uh, as impactful in the short term an initiative as exists. Uh, we've worked with the legislature now for three quarters of a year. It's well past time that the legislature passed not only the teacher reciprocity bill that was introduced by Senator McBroom, but also the uh, counselor uh, reciprocity bill that was introduced, as you point out, from, by Senator uh, McCann. Thank you very much for, for sharing, uh, Chairwoman Lipton. Um, any other uh, questions or comments for uh, Mr. Ackley or um, Chairwoman Lipton, uh, Dr. Pugh, and then to uh, Dr. Pritchett for her report? Um, when we, the last time that we met, um, I read portions of uh, the Michigan student rights um, language that they proposed that um, we take up. And I know we talked about it and just want to make sure that we get that on the agenda um, and then also wanted to make sure that we are talking about red flag laws and, and the gun safety laws and um, making sure that we're taking a position on um, safety mechanisms that don't create militarized zones but also make sure that we're protecting our children as well as our educators. and. Um, that we're looking at all of these issues in a well-rounded way, that we are preparing our, our staff to deal with uh, the mental health issues uh, that we are seeing in our, in our school districts, but also making sure that um, we have safety mechanisms, again, um, that don't put more guns in, in, in the classroom or more, um, and again, making our, our school environments um, less than just that school environment. 
So um, just want to make sure that, that, that we are talking about that as well. And that was something that I brought up in June also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, important areas. Dr. Pritchett, to you. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, and I mentioned this at the last board meeting in June, uh, the Public Education Position Subcommittee of NASB is meeting uh, monthly to review one section of a document that is available to all NASB board members. Um, and that section deals with retention, recruitment of teachers and staff, uh, obviously an issue that every state in the U.S. is dealing with right now. Uh, we are adding some language into that section. My sense is we'll probably reach consensus on that at our meeting next week, uh, and then I will be sharing that with the board in September because the NASB conference is the end of October, um, and there will have to be, they'll be put up for a vote for acceptance or non-acceptance, one of the two. So that's all I have to report at this point. As soon as we have solid language, I'll share that with the rest of the board members. Very small section of um, the uh, uh, position papers. We've got some work positions. to we've got some work to accomplish uh, at the end of October with NASB. Right. Yeah. Right. In this area and, and others. Right. Yes. Thank you. Any other um, any other reflections? Anything for Dr. Pritchett? Once, twice, thrice. Tried. Can you give it away. Thank you so much. Board. Um, Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to move to the approval of State Board of Education meeting minutes and then into uh, lunch. Um, may I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of June 14th, 2022? So moved. So moved by Dr. Pritchett, second by Ms. Tilly. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we could have a roll call vote. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Unanimous approval. Very good. Thank you. Um, thank you, board. Thank you, Marilyn. It is 11.52. Um, we're going to break for uh, lunch. If we could reconvene at uh, 5 till 1, 12.55, hour and three-minute lunch. Um, we have uh, a fair number of uh, people um, to uh, speak virtually during public comment, so we need to come back and